Find out more by visiting the station's website at kpfa.org or by contacting the local election supervisor at election at kpfa.org or 510-848-6767, extension 212. 510-848-6767, extension 212. Get involved and stay involved. And you are listening to 94.1 KPFA in Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. The time is 1.30, and up next, Making Contact. This week on Making Contact. We decided we wanted to see what was in Nagasaki. It was just dust and debris. And the smell was horrible. You could smell death all around you. The U.S. dropped the world's first atomic bomb on Hiroshima, Japan, on August 6, 1945. Three days later, the fishing village of Nagasaki also fell victim. I tried to be quiet, but there were bones lying all entangled. And when I took a step, they would crack. On this edition, preserving the voices and lessons of the most deadly attacks the world has ever seen. We commemorate the anniversary of the bombings with excerpts from two documentaries, Hiroshima Countdown and Nagasaki Journey. I'm Kyung Jin Lee, and this is Making Contact, a program connecting people, vital ideas, and important information. Originally, Nagasaki was not the intended target for the second atomic bomb. But when clouds and smoke blocked the pilots' visibility of the primary target, they proceeded to the port town, an important strategic target for the U.S. The bomb destroyed 40% of the city's infrastructure. It killed or injured one-third of the total population. And the remaining survivors, as well as many American soldiers who occupied Japan, continued to struggle with the trauma. Andrew Phillips' documentary film, Hiroshima Countdown, includes first-hand accounts from the pilots who dropped the bomb in Nagasaki. This is one in a series of interviews conducted by the Air Force Historical Division. Today we are interviewing Brigadier General Paul W. Tibbetts, Jr., who is retiring. They were definitely military targets, there was no question about that. And they offered such a... uh, you could almost say a, a, a classroom experiment as far as being able to determine later the bomb damage. These were these were good virgin targets, and they were they were ideal uh, for the purpose that uh, we wanted to use them for. The consideration of targets would be Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Niigata, Kakura, and there was one more that I don't remember. The 20th Air Force had been told they would not attack those targets under any circumstances. In other words, the ground was laid. As well as these targets, Kyoto, Japan's ancient capital, was strongly recommended by the man with overall control of the bomb project, General Leslie Groves. But Secretary of War Henry Stimson, approaching 80 years of age, would not have it. He'd visited Kyoto with his wife in the 20s and had enjoyed the city's cultural riches. It was a city of great religious significance to the Japanese, and Stimson felt Kyoto's destruction would damage America's post-war stature. The selection of the targets in the month of May 1945 was actually done by the intelligence community in headquarters U.S. Air Force. The requirements given to them was you will select cities that have military targets in them. And they also selected the type of terrain that they wanted. They also were interested in the type of construction that they could expect to run into. Because in reality, not only was this a military mission, but it was also of extreme scientific importance because they wanted to know what a weapon of this type could do against reinforced concrete, what it could do against steel, what it would do against anything that that was in the building materials line. It it had to be something that had not been attacked by the 20th Air Force up to that time. Call it virgin targets, undamaged, unhurt by any other type of an explosive or munition. I know the type of bomb we were working on. 
Charles Sweeney flew with Tibbets in an observer aircraft to witness the bombing of Hiroshima. Three days later, he would lead his crew first to Kakura, the primary target for the second bomb, and then to Nagasaki. Kakura was clouded in that day. As he was talking, he picked up a handful of earth. He said, basically what we're working on is a single bomb that will turn a whole city into this. And he just tossed a handful of sand into the air. While the American pilots saw the devastation wrought by the bomb, they didn't experience the death and destruction felt by those on the ground. Up next, we bring you a radio adaptation of the film Nagasaki Journey, which shares the stories of two Japanese survivors and a U.S. Marine who occupied the city when the war ended. The film was produced by Christopher Beaver and Judy Irving. August 9, 1945, three days after the destruction of Hiroshima, a B-29 bomber under the command of the United States Army Air Forces also destroyed the city of Nagasaki. On the ground beneath the atomic explosion, temperatures were hot enough to melt concrete and steel. Within seconds, more than 70,000 people had been killed and another 100,000 fatally injured. On the surface, Nagasaki today looks normal. Yet hidden from the casual visitor in hospitals and homes, the atomic bomb continues to claim its final victims. Soon, the last survivors will be gone. Their personal accounts relegated to history. One of the few visible traces remaining stands on an overlook above the city. A single broken Tory gate marking the pathway to a hillside shrine. But even the few visible traces are more obvious than the effect of the bomb on the spirit. This is Sumiteru Taniguchi, home from his job at the post office. In 1945, when the bomb dropped, he was 16 years old. I was riding my bicycle, delivering mail, when I heard what seemed to be the faint roar of an aircraft. And the instant that I thought that a plane might have come in, I was thrown or blown with my bicycle. gathered up the scattered letters and put them with my bicycle. Then I walked to an air raid shelter about 350 yards away. I sat down on a ledge and realized I could no longer stand. I didn't know many nightmares in which I felt the approach of death. I don't know whether to call it a dream or just a memory of a painful time. I was only a child, but I had been taught in school that Japan would definitely win the war and that winning was correct. And I believe that Japan would win. During the time I lay in bed, I began to hate my parents, everyone's parents. I found myself hating not only the war itself, but all the parents who had not opposed it.
Japanese surrender was announced on August 14, 1945, less than one week after the destruction of Nagasaki. For most Americans, the bomb meant peace and victory and an end to the Second World War. It meant the troops were coming home. American troops did not go home, no matter how homesick and war-weary they were. For many of them, it was time to go to Japan, not as the invasion force they had expected to be, but as a military occupation to disarm the Japanese and ensure the peace. And for the Japanese, who had been at war since their invasion of China in 1937, it was time to accept the inconceivable. It was time to meet the powerful enemy who had defeated them. Among the U.S. Marines destined for Japan was a 29-year-old postal clerk named Victor Tali, whose chance encounter in Nagasaki would change his life. We were not going in as warriors. We were not going to fight these people or invade them or get killed or injured. We knew this time we were the winners. Now, the first thing my troop ship saw was the Mitsubishi shipyard. And when those men saw that, they were very subdued. And then in a murmur, you could hear them say, God, look what it did. One bomb did that. Jesus, I'm glad it was them and not us. I wonder what it's like up in the city. They were curious. They wanted to know what was going to happen to them. The Japanese had been told the Marines, when they did occupy a city, they would rape young girls, they would kill the elderly, they would loot their homes, and they were actually afraid of us. They were scared to death, and I couldn't blame them. Now, when they finally found a building for us, and they trucked us to this building, all of the windows were knocked out. All of the windows were gone. Upstairs, there was room to put our cots so we could sleep upstairs. It was a pretty good building, considering condition of some of the others. But I remember saying, hoorah, we're right in the middle of Nagasaki, and we were. A lot of Marines were going back and forth. Second Marine Division men going to the 5th to get supplies in the 5th coming into Nagasaki. And they had a small railroad. It would leave in the morning and come back later that day. And we had to ride that and it went right through the hypo center. Right through where they had dropped the bomb. we went down to have our evening meal and we decided five of my buddies we decided we wanted to see what was in Nagasaki there was no movement and there was absolutely deathly silence it was just dust and debris and the smell was horrible you could smell death all around you and they had to cremate a lot of their people. And they would just build a tier of lumber and set it on fire. But I didn't want to stay and watch it. And I got separated from these guys. And here I am in a part of Nagasaki I wasn't familiar with. And I got turned around. And I wasn't sure how to get back to my base. And 
I saw a group of children playing. And I waved and yelled at them. And they all looked and screamed and ran. But one little boy. And I'm trying to tell him I've got to get back my barracks, you know, and can you help me? And he noticed my bracelet. And as I opened it up, I showed this little boy this picture. My wife and two little girls. And he jumped up and down and he said, sister, sister. And he made a motion with his hands that she was big. So I figured he had a pregnant sister. Well, he ran upstairs real fast and he brought his father down. And he could speak pretty good English. He said, I'd like you to meet my wife and daughter. And yes, she was pregnant. And he invited me into his house. And while he and I were talking about the war and various things, I glanced up at the mantel and saw a picture of a very young Japanese soldier. And I asked him, I said, is that your son? And he said, no, shook his head. He said, that is my daughter's husband. And we don't know where he is. We haven't heard from him in a long time. And when he said that, my mind flashed back to one day on Saipan when I was on a patrol and a Japanese jumped up at me out of the shrub and I shot him. And I thought, my God, I wonder, could that have been his son-in-law? In that very moment, when I saw that picture, I guess kind of changed my whole life. I think I wanted to be kinder to people. I didn't want to get mad at people. I didn't ever want to have to kill anybody again. And I've always thought, I hope he made it home, just like I did. December 6, 1945, he left Nagasaki for home and family, almost four years to the day since the war had begun for the United States with the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. We'll be right back. You're listening to Making Contact, a production of the National Radio Project. If you'd like more information or for CD copies of this program, please call 800-529-5736. Because of listeners like you, this show is distributed for free to radio stations in the U.S., Canada, and South Africa. To find out how to support us, download shows, or get our podcasts, go to radioproject.org. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Our handle is making underscore contact. We now return to a radio adaptation of the documentary film Nagasaki Journey by Christopher Beaver and Judy Irving. Left behind was a city still searching for its missing children. A city where a woman named Itsuko Okubo was about to discover the fate of her long lost son, a young medical student named Akira. From the time he was a small boy, Akira had been very fond of animals. When he was in science classes, he would concentrate very hard on animals, sketching them and studying them. When he spent time at Mount Kompira, he was also very interested in insects, and he would collect them from all over. You can see how carefully he has drawn pictures of animals in this notebook. I was planning to throw these away, but they were too well drawn. 
So I have carefully kept them until today. He loved planes and warships and often drew them as well. He was a child who was born in war and died in war, and that must have been his fate. It's just an old notebook, but I have carefully kept it. When the bomb dropped and Akira did not come home, Mrs. Okubo started searching for him. She now retraces the long journey to find her missing son, accompanied by one of her surviving children and the electrical lineman who found Akira. August 9, 1945, when the bomb dropped. And Akira did not come home the next day, so I started looking for him. I thought the only place that he could have fled would have been Mount Kompira, so I went there and searched for him, but could learn nothing. Then I heard he had been in class at the medical college lecture hall at the time of the blast, and I went to see the ruins there. When I arrived, I was completely beside myself. I tried to be quiet. I kicked off my sandals and entered the place in only my tabby socks. But there were bones lying all entangled. And when I took a step, they would crack. Finally, I took four or five gold buttons from the uniform of his school and part of a school cap and some bones home with me. We paid our last respects and had a very simple funeral. Even after this, I felt somehow that he was alive somewhere. And at night, if I heard the sound of footsteps, I would think he had returned. And I often jumped up to check. But he did not return. And I gave up hope. The new year dawned with everything in disorder. But on January 18, 1946, Akira's remains were discovered halfway up Mount Kompira beside a power stanchion, lying buried face down in dead leaves. Positive identification was provided by a name tag that had been sewn on the back of his leggings. From the time he was in junior high school, 
Akira always wandered around this area because he loved to collect insects. He had an uncle on the other side of the mountain, and I think that he tried to flee there. Taking the shortest route possible and using a path few people traveled. I shall never forget the kindness of the electrical lineman who discovered Akira's body. I could only think of this as a miracle. This would be Mrs. Okubo's final visit to the spot where her son was found. She died shortly before the 50th anniversary of the atomic bombing. Nagasaki, as the city continues to expand, fewer and fewer residents have first-hand memories of the atomic bomb. Yet its invisible effect lingers. The bombs that exploded here and in Hiroshima triggered the atomic age, which now casts its shadow around the world. He was a child who was born in war and died in war, and that must have been his fate. Mrs. Okubo, survived by four sons and three daughters, is remembered in the home she occupied when she began her search for Akira. It changed my whole philosophy of life. I think I wanted to be kinder to people. I didn't want to get mad at people. I didn't ever want to have to kill anybody again. Victor Tolley devoted his retirement to the cause of American veterans who had been exposed to radiation, not only in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but in hundreds of peacetime atomic tests. <laughs> I found myself hating not only the war itself, but all the parents who had not opposed it. After Sumi Teru Taniguchi retired, he became a full-time volunteer at the Atomic Bomb Survivors Council, teaching a different lesson than he had been taught as a child. When the final story is told, when the last survivor is gone, this legacy will pass to another generation. Perhaps they will determine whether Nagasaki was simply the second city to be bombed or whether it will be the last. That's it for this edition of Making Contact. For more information about the documentaries we excerpted today, Nagasaki Journey and Hiroshima Countdown, go to our website, radioproject.org. For a CD copy of this program, call the National Radio Project at 800-529-5736 or check out our website, radioproject.org, to get a podcast, download past shows, or make a difference by supporting our work. Like Making Contact on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. Our handle is making underscore contact. Hello, I'm Andrew Phillips, the Interim General Manager here at KPFA 94.1 FM. Listener-supported Community Pacifica Radio. And I want to thank you for your generous support in our recent fundraising. With your help, we exceeded our goal. So please pay your pledge. You can go to kpfa.org to pledge and become a member of KPFA. By doing that, you help ensure that we keep doing the work we know you appreciate. 
I also want to thank and acknowledge the work of our producers here at KPFA. You know who they are. You've heard them pitching their hearts out these past couple of weeks. They're the blood and bone, paid staff and volunteers 